Hey, greetings, everyone. My name is Brian Williams, and I would like to welcome you all to our webinar on how positive school climate can enhance school safety. This webinar is being hosted by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students in collaboration with the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Technical Assistance Center. This webinar is designed to provide an in-depth review of the Closer Look section on school climate as put forth in the Obama administration's recently released Guide for Developing High-Quality School Emergency Operations. This new guide, developed by the Department of Education in collaboration with the Departments of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Justice, and led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Health and Human Services, represent the culmination of work by, year, I'm sorry, years of work by the federal government. Now I would like to turn it over to my colleagues from the RIMS Technical Assistance Center. Thank you, Brian. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our call today is set so that only presenters can speak to the group. However, we will be taking questions. You may submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the online Q&A chat function located in the lower right side of your screen. Our presenters will respond to questions during the Q&A session at the end of the training in the order in which they are received and as time permits. Just above the Q&A chat window on your screen, you will see a file share pod that contains a downloadable PDF of today's webinar slide. Please click on the file name and then click on the Download Files button to save the webinar slides to your computer. Now let's get started. Today our presenters are David Esquith, the Director of the Office of Safe and Healthy Students at the U.S. Department of Education, and Dr. David Osher, Vice President, AIR Fellow in Health and Social Development Program. David Esquith has served in the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services for 23 years. He, be, he brings a wealth of program management experience to OSHS, having worked with formula and discretionary grant programs in the Office of Special Education Programs, the Rehabilitation Services Administration, RSA, and the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDER. Mr. Esquith has served as Special Advisor to the NIDER Director as well as NIDER's Deputy Director. When the department reorganized RSA in 2005, he was integrally involved in restructuring the agency and served as the Director of the State Monitoring and Program Improvement Division. Mr. Esquith has worked as a special education teacher and administrator, Peace Corps volunteer, lobbyist for the Association for Retarded Citizens, congressional aide, and recently completed an extended detail at the Office of Management and Budget as a program examiner. Dr. Osher's work focuses on school improvement and educational equity, interagency and cross-stakeholder collaboration, children's services, mental health, prevention, performance measurement and improvement, social-emotional learning, cultural competence, and the conditions for learning and healthy development. He currently serves as principal investigator of four major research and technical assistance centers funded by the U.S. government, the National Center for Mental Health Promotion and Violence Prevention, the Technical Assistance Partnership for Child and Family Mental Health, the National Evaluation and Technical Assistance Center for the Education of Children and Youth Who Are Neglected, Delinquent, or at Risk, and the National Center for Safe and Supported Schools. Dr. Osher also serves as Principal Investigator of a Contract to Help the Federal Agency Interagency Working Group on Youth Programs Improve the Coordination and Efficiency of Youth Programs Across 12 Federal Departments and Executive Agencies, and to develop a national plan for youth aged 10 to 24. Dr. Osher and his colleagues have developed multiple student and staff school climate surveys and have done extensive research on social emotional learning and on the conditions for learning. He was academic dean of a liberal arts college and two professional schools of human services, has consulted with ministries, NGOs, educators, and human service professionals across the world serves on numerous expert panels and editorial boards, and authored or co-authored over 290 books, monographs, chapters, articles, and reports. And now we'll begin the presentation. Mr. Esquith? <clears throat> well, thank you, Sean, and good afternoon and, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast, and, and thank you for participating. Um, before we get into the content of the uh, 
our closer look on school climate and emergencies. I want, I want to give you all some brief background on um, why this section was developed and the context in which it was developed. This really dates back to December 14, 2012, when we had the tragedy at, uh, at Newtown. And in response to that tragedy, the, uh, the administration uh, and the president and the vice president put together a plan called Now is the Time that uh, was designed to come up with a number of executive actions the, uh, uh, the administration could take to reduce gun violence and to make our schools, communities uh, uh, safer. The Department of Education, the, the first slide that you're seeing um, is really an important one in terms of capturing um, what this is about. Um, first of all, the, the webinar that we're doing today is really taking a look at school climate as it relates to emergencies and emergency planning. Um, this is not a webinar that's going to go into uh, uh, significant detail on school climate per se, but the nexus between school climate and emergencies. This was just one of um, four closer look sections in the guide for developing high quality school emergency operations plan that was developed by uh, all of the agencies that you see at the, uh, the bottom of the screen. There are other closer look sections and they include information sharing which addresses FERPA and HIPAA psychological first aid for schools, and active shooter situations. Um, so those three topics, in addition to school climate and emergencies, um, you will find in the guide for developing high quality uh, school emergency operations plan. And if you have not seen the, uh, the guide, um, I strongly encourage you to, uh, uh, to, to go online. At the, at the end of the webinar, we're going to go through some resources and, and make sure that uh, uh, you have all the information that you need to access those resources. Um, and so that, that's a bit of background. The, the, the now, now is the Time came out in, um, on January 16th. The guides were released on June 18th, and the Vice President rolled them out at a uh, uh, meeting at, at the White House. Um, these guides and, and this particular section, the other sections, have received kind of the attention of a number of um, federal agencies. Um, it is the, the first time that all of these agencies have worked together on um, a manual that, uh, that helps schools plan for, uh, for emergencies. And we hope that the information that you find here will um, assist you in your emergency operations planning and on this particular topic, kind of the nexus between school climate and emergencies. So that's a little background to, uh, uh, to the, what you're about to see. Um, in terms of the agenda, uh, I'm going to cover um, the kind of the first half of the, of the webinar on school climate and emergencies and conducting a comprehensive needs assessment and how school climate fits into that. And then our distinguished colleague, uh, David Osher, is going to address multi-tiered interventions and supports and promoting social and emotional competencies. And um, as I said, school climate is a very broad topic. The information that David is going to, uh, uh, to present on multi-tiered interventions and supports and promoting social and emotional competencies are some recommendations that we have about improving school climate. There are many ways to, in, to improve school climate and address a school climate. Um, these are good examples of, uh, um, of areas that um, these federal agencies recommend. And so I, I just want to kind of put this in context. This is not uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the universe of um, topics or concerns or approaches to school climate. These are um, a couple that we believe are uh, recommend as important and um, to help you make that uh, connection between school climate and emergency planning. For the purposes of our discussion and for the purposes of the guide, um, we are referring to school climate as describing a range of campus conditions, including safety, relationships, and engagement. 
and the environment that may influence student learning and well-being. Throughout the webinar and throughout a lot of the, uh, uh, the information that the Department of Education puts out around school climate, um, you, you'll see us make a connection between school climate and um, positive responses to behavior. Um, we believe that positive school climate um, promotes student learning and well-being and that uh, uh, some of the features of a positive school climate are um, safe environments free of violence, bullying, harassment, and substance use, appropriate facilities and physical surroundings, supportive academic settings, and clear and fair disciplinary policies. And uh, just a uh, a slight tangent on that on that final bullet. Um, another one of the executive actions that was included in Now is the Time um, instructed the Department of Education to come up with best practices on school discipline policies. And those will be coming out uh, uh, in the near future. So um, if you have an interest in uh, uh, discipline policies, um, please look for that. The, the information will appear on, our, uh, on the department's website and our REMS DA Center website. And as you can see from this slide, the, the, the lens that we are looking through on school climate um, relates to preventing and, and responding positively to certain disruptive behavior, but it also includes facilities and physical surroundings, and then the policies and procedures that uh, schools um, utilize. Um, a couple of other uh, features are respectful, trusting, and caring relationships throughout the school community, um, and available social, emotional, and behavioral supports. The, uh, uh, the, the, this latter bullet on available social, emotional, and behavioral supports relates very much to the role of um, school support personnel, social workers, psychologists, um, the, uh, uh, the range of individuals who are um, within a uh, uh, the, the school facility who are available to students to provide that kind of support in addition to the teachers um, and this idea of a respectful trusting and caring relationships one of the one of the things that we've learned in dealing and, and taking a look at the history of, uh, uh, of active shooter situations is that in many cases the uh, uh, school shootings were known um, or there, there was information that had not been reported to adults or school officials that other students had. And so it's in, those, in, in some cases, we know that school shootings have been prevented or the, the possibility of a school shooting has been prevented because um, there has been a trusting and caring relationship between students and adults in the, uh, in the school building. And in other cases, um, unfortunately, we know that uh, the, the shooter um, had uh, uh, shared some information with, uh, uh, with other students that um, to indicate that something was up, that there was a possibility that uh, there would be an incident, and unfortunately the uh, um, other students did not, uh, did not report it. So this, again, this nexus between school climate and, and trust and, and respect um, contributes to uh, uh, um, preventing incidents and responding to emergencies, and we'll get into some of that in a moment. Student experiences which contribute to, uh, to, to poor school climate and low academic achievement may include the following. Um, these are some of the characteristics that, uh, that we've observed in terms of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the poor school climate, um, a feeling, a lack of connectedness, a lack of safety, um, high incidence of teasing, bullying, and, and gang activity, negative relationships with adults and peers, and reactive punitive approaches to, to discipline. A lot of the work that the department is doing now in terms of the uh, uh, best practices on, on discipline policies is, is really uh, um, taking a look at the ways that school systems can um, have, be fair, um, that there will be consequences to, uh, 
uh, to inappropriate behavior, but that those consequences are as positive as possible, and 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 we do everything we can to keep uh, students in school. So reactive, punitive approaches to discipline we know contributes to uh, to poor school climate, and and this notion of a kind of a lack of um, connectedness is critically important, um, and the ability of school staff to um, to recognize when a uh, uh, when there is a lack of connectedness uh, on the parts of students, students who may be uh, uh, have a change in behavior, um, who are not communicating with um, other with their peers, with uh, with teachers. Um, there has to be a, a sensitivity and, and an ability and a process, and we'll get into that a little bit in terms of um, assessment, to, um, to kind of identify those students, reach out to them, try to make that connection, and um, bring them um, into the school community, um, both for themselves and, and as a matter of safety and security for others. We know that a, a positive school climate can affect the capacity of students and staff to prevent, respond to, and recover from emergencies by reducing the incidence of behaviors that contribute to crisis and engaging students in developing strong relationships with staff and peers. And so on this slide, what, what you're seeing is, and those of you who are familiar with emergency planning, is that one of the, the kind of the uh, the approaches that we take uh, in the guides towards emergency planning is um, not just looking at kind of response to a particular incident, but what can we do to plan to prevent incidents from happening, um, to mitigate them or lessen their impact, to respond effectively, and then to recover. Um, we're going to go through uh, kind of this, this connection between um, school climate and um, each of these phases, if you want to look at them as, as phases in, uh, in, in emergency planning, uh, to see what that connection is. But I, I hope that one of the things that you take away from the webinar is that there is a connection um, between improved school climate, positive school climate, and the, uh, uh, the, the ability of a school to successfully prevent, respond to, and recover uh, from an emergency. We know that um, in terms of response, um, a, a, as we have um, taken a look at lessons learned from um, various incidents, that schools with um, positive school climates teach students um, social and emotional um, competencies and the ability to manage their emotions uh, during a crisis. Um, if you go through the guide, and particularly the active shooter section of the guide, you'll see that um, uh, one of the things that we know about a particular incident, whether it's an active shooter or a tornado, where you've got six to 12 minutes to respond to a tornado being sighted, um, or a, uh, a, a, a gas leak, uh, a fire, that once an incident occurs, um, things are extremely hectic. Um, everyone has to know exactly what to do in response in order to, uh, uh, to be safe. The extent to which um, students and staff have um, social and, and emotional competencies, they're well-grounded, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're thinking as clearly as possible in, in an emergency situation we know that they are more likely to be able to manage the, uh, the, res the response procedures that uh, uh, they must undertake. And we also know that during the course of a particular incident, um, unexpected things happen. You can drill and, and conduct exercises, and, and those are important towards um, ingraining the, uh, uh, the appropriate behavior into, uh, uh, into students, staff, and visitors. But something is always a little different, um, or it can be significantly different from the way you drilled and trained. So the extent to which we have um, strong social and emotional competencies as, as part of the, the makeup of, uh, of students and staff, um, we know that they are um, uh, in a better position to make those instant split-second decisions that um, can be the, uh, the difference sometimes between serious injury and, and, and responding to an emergency uh, 
uh, effectively and, and safely. And then finally, recovery. Um, they, uh, we know that a positive school climate can help in the recovery because it represents a commitment even prior to an emergency to providing emotional and mental health services and supports to all members of the community. It can take a significant amount of time for um, students, uh, staff, parents, the community to recover from a, an incident. The, the magnitude of some of the incidents that we deal with um, are, are such that it will it can take years and the extent to which uh, the, the climate of the school is positive um, that uh, students and staff are <clears throat> feeling connected um, feeling that they have trust relationships with uh, uh, with each other and with adults promotes recovery um, it uh, uh, it has a significant impact on the ability of, uh, uh, of students and staff to, uh, to restore the learning environment, to uh, uh, address their uh, social and emotional needs, and, and recover. So again, kind of this connection between positive school climate, promoting it, um, the, uh, the ability to prevent um, incidents, the ability to respond to them, and here the ability to recover from them. Um, so what can schools do? And um, what, we, uh, uh, what we recommend in terms of building the capacity of students and staff to, uh, uh, to go through the, the phases that I've identified of prevention, response, and recovery, um, they can conduct a comprehensive needs assessment. Um, that will enable them to understand um, in, uh, uh, in concrete terms the, uh, the nature and, and extent uh, uh, of school climate and school climate issues that the school may be facing. It's, it's important to get grounded in um, data and information and um, kind of a, a thoughtful assessment, a thoughtful and comprehensive assessment of school climate. As David will go into, um, another thing schools can do is, is use kind of multi-tiered interventions and supports and promoting social and emotional competencies. He'll cover that. The, uh, uh, um, the, the needs assessment is, a, um, as I said, a, a critical piece in understanding um, the, uh, uh, the, the current status of the school climate and coming up with a, um, a strategy to address um, weaknesses and, and deficiencies in school climate in order to promote it. Um, unless you have a, uh, a good assessment of school climate, um, <clears throat> that you, the, uh, the, the likelihood that you will um, uh, utilize uh, appropriate intervention strategies and programs to address issues is um, to a certain extent uh, less likely to exceed, succeed than if you have first of all conducted a comprehensive needs assessment. And there are needs assessments out there. Um, another one of the, uh, uh, the executive actions, and now is the time, is um, instructs the Department of Education to develop a uh, 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 a school climate uh, uh, needs assessment, and we're doing that. And this will be made available to uh, uh, to school systems at, at no cost. So we're we're on the uh, uh, the early stages of developing that. I, I don't have a, a time frame yet of when it will be released, but we're hoping that what it does is give um, schools a um, a um, thorough uh, and um, easy to use school climate assessment tool that they can then um, take that information and apply it to uh, the strategies that, that are customized to particular schools and address the school climate issues because there can be a host of them that the, uh, the school needs to address. Um, we know that the needs assessment should include student perceptions and where appropriate parent and staff perceptions to help schools identify key issues. Um, that by monitoring these indicators, schools may identify threats and use this information to implement appropriate interventions or programs. 
and that these data can be most effective when used for decision making and are disaggregated. So um, there's, there's no doubt about it that it takes some work. Uh, it takes um, having the right tool, um, kind of a willingness to have those candid conversations about the, uh, the areas of improvement in school climate that a, uh, that a school and community um, uh, needs to address and that um, there's a kind of a, 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 a thoughtful connection between the information um, generated by the assessment, the strategies that um, the school will use to address those, uh, those issues, and integrating that into um, emergency operations planning. Measures of school, we know that measures of school climate should encompass multiple aspects of it. Um, be able to be processed quickly enough to share before the end of the school year, um, be collected through valid and reliable instruments, and be collected from multiple respondents. One of the, uh, uh, one of the behaviors that we see in, in, in terms of schools uh, conducting uh, school climate surveys is that um, they, they may uh, uh, kind of target only certain um, elements of the school community. Um, we've seen some schools that will do a survey with just with teachers or just with uh, uh, students. And um, what we're encouraging here is that um, there be multiple respondents, that students be surveyed, that teachers be surveyed, that parents be surveyed. and um, that support staff be surveyed. Sometimes um, we know that the best informed uh, uh, members of a, uh, of a school staff in terms of what's going on, what the climate is at that school, are the bus drivers, are the, people, are the SROs, are the, uh, uh, the, the social workers and school psychologists, and that it's important to, um, to the extent uh, appropriate uh, and possible um, include as many members of the school community in the school climate survey in order to get a complete picture of, of what's going on in the school. Um, as I said, it should be collected so that subgroups can be examined um, using multiple instruments if possible and um, making that connection between measures that are understood and the impact on academics. Um, at this point, um, the, 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 the nexus between school climate and academic performance is, uh, 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 is a strong one. Um, we know that if you improve school climate, um, you are uh, very likely to see improved uh, academic uh, uh, performance. And um, as I've been suggesting, that the information um, that is generated by the school climate survey be actionable and practical to, uh, uh, to administer. So that wraps up the, uh, uh, the, uh, this segment uh, of the webinar. I hope that uh, what you've taken away is that um, the, uh, uh, the connection between emergency planning and school climate is an integral one. To, uh, to both, and um, our distinguished colleague Dave Osher is going to take over and, and uh, address multi-tiered interventions and support and social and emotional competencies. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. I thought that was a, 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 a really strong, in my mind I was saying brilliant, but I don't use hyperbole, so a really good presentation. And it's because school climate is so important to emergency response and because it really has the academic payoffs that David Esquit just mentioned, that it's particularly important to really be data-informed and intentional in how one works to improve school climate. Um, in other words, that while climate is something that people experience emotionally, it's something that we can really work on in a logical, rational, and data-driven way. Um, and if we do so, um, many people find that the best way of improving climate, just as a best way of targeting resources for academics, or in the public health space, a best way of targeting interventions, is to really use a multi-tiered framework that enables you to provide a continuum of 
behavioral supports and interventions to improve student behavior and achievement. Um, and so I want to now outline that framework um, or an example of that framework. And let's start with a, a triangle. And many of you may have, may have seen a triangle. It's used in the public health world. It's used in response and intervention in academics. It's been used for two decades in the world of violence prevention by the Department of Justice. Um, and a way of thinking about it is there is a foundation. It's what we do for everybody in a school. Um, and examples of that could be um, the use of positive behavioral interventions and support school-wide um, to really train and support staff in responding to the behavioral needs of students. It could be the use of school-wide interventions to build students' social and emotional competencies. And there are a variety of evidence-based programs that, have, um, that do that, that the What Works Clearinghouse talks about. It could be school-wide efforts at really making students feel connected. Um, and I could go on in terms of school-wide bullying and so forth. But the bottom line is that it is very important in an intentional school-wide way to do things that ensure, make it more likely that everyone feels physically and emotionally safe, that everyone feels connected to each other. This is also parents coming into the school. Um, that everyone feels engaged in the academic enterprise and supported in that, in their ability to succeed. And everybody learns to behave appropriately, doing the things that are healthy, not doing the things that are unhealthy, and being an upstander in situations where there are things like bullying. If one has that foundation in place, it then is much easier to identify who are young people who are at elevated levels of risk. Now, sometimes we don't have to look for them. We know that they may be at elevated levels of risk because they're a member of a group who is at elevated levels of, at risk. So for example, we know enough now that when students transition to a, a new school, or where students' parents have been deployed, or where students have experienced trauma in their life or been exposed to violence, that m makes it more likely that bad things can happen if we don't intervene. And so we want to do efficient early intervention. At the same time, an increasing number of schools are developing early warning systems to identify students who are at elevated levels of risk. Say, for example, that their attendance is poor. And one can, can in a school that has a good foundation, more easily serve the young people who are at that elevated level of risk by efficient interventions, for example, ones that really try to connect the children who are, have poor attendance and to make sure that they feel that this is a place, the school is a place that they want to be. And if you have a school that has a good foundation and a school that has the capacity to intervene early, then it becomes both easier to provide intensive supports to the fewer number of students who need them. And at the same time, because you have that foundation in place that is preventative in the way that David Eskwith has talked about, and because you're doing early interventions that can also be preventative, it is also less likely that as many students will need those intensive interventions. But even if you have the best foundation, and even if you have very efficient early interventions, it's likely that there will be some young people who do need interventions that are intensive. And those are ones that are likely to engage the family. Those are ones that tend to be more intrusive as well as intensive. So it's really important to think about them in way and, and, and implement them in ways that are individualized, customized, are respectful of families, are listening to the voices of, of young people and all people who are important in terms of making an intensive intervention work. 
if you have the type of data collection systems that David Eswick talked about in terms of good school climate work, and if you are able to disaggregate them, it becomes easier to start um, identifying what are the array of universal interventions, early interventions, and intensive interventions that you might need. And so just for example, um, if you were to disaggregate your data and you found out that young women felt less safe than young men in the school, one of the things you may want to do is do something to enhance the level of safety on the part of young, young women. And schools that use this multi-tiered model and use data to inform it, monitor, to monitor their progress year by year in enhancing the fact that more people feel safe, more people feel connected, and more people feel engaged in the academic process. There are numerous benefits to multi-tiered interventions and support. Um, one, and I just want to reinforce the point that David made before, they build skills that can support life and resiliency in crises. We can never predict, but developing in young people the ability to quickly analyze, to know how to handle stress, to know both how to stop and think, and at the same time be active in what they do is really important in crisis situations. Um, it also reduces problem behaviors by making students feel more safer and by improving their academic performance. And if we reduce problem behaviors that are routine in the school, it makes it easier to protect against the, the less likely but highly pro problematic intrusions that might be coming into the school. Um, it also, the multi-tiered interventions also provide a structure to customize and organize practices and programs based on data. Schools do a lot of things. Um, they don't have a lot of resources. And what we know more and more is that if schools want to be maximally effective, they really have to target their resources, make sure that their different interventions connect with each other so that it is easier for staff to implement interventions and easier for other stakeholders, including children and families, to understand the array of interventions. Um, and when we have the multi-tiered interventions and support, it's easier to be better identify students who struggle with trauma post-event um, and to select appropriate interventions to help them recover. And I would add that not only does it make it easier to tailor interventions, but if you think about the fact that what we know about tra trauma recovery is that it really requires um, people being in environments that are nurturant and supportive, that maximize their feeling of comfort, and ones that reinforce their ability to feel that they're in control, having a universal foundation in place helps that, as do, does doing early interventions to prevent young people who might be coming more aggressive for, for, from becoming aggressive. And that's important in terms of how they react and interact with young people who have experienced trauma in a school-related trauma event or maybe in a community-related trauma event. As David said earlier, it's important to promote the development of social and emotional competencies. Um, and that's more than teaching people social skills. It's, te it's helping people develop the fundamental attributes that can help them understand themselves and understand others, manage themselves as well as manage other relationships, and being in a situation where they can make healthy and responsible decisions at the right time. Um, you know, social emotional learning, which is a language that some people use for how we develop emotional intelligence, can help individuals, young people as well as adults, 
learn to stop and think before they react. And if you just think about yourself and others, we know how we sometimes experience what people like Dan Goldman call an amygdala hijack, where ultimately we are more in um, a fight or flight mode than we are in being um, thoughtful and responsive in, in situations that really require being thoughtful and responsive. So, social emotional learning can help people develop those skills. Similarly, it can help people understand and manage their response to stress, stress management, to, because they understand more about themselves and others, to develop supportive and caring relationships, to persist through challenges. If people know Paul Tuff's book or the work of Angela Duckworth, who just won a MacArthur Genius Award, who talks about grit, one of the things we need is tenacity. We need tenacity academically. If we think about crisis situations, we need tenacity on the part of people to really act appropriately, but also be tenacious in those situations. The ability to ask for help and the ability to pay attention to your own needs, but also the needs of others. These and other social emotional competencies can be taught, can be developed, and they can help individuals prepare for and respond to emergencies. And students are more likely to develop these competencies when they have good relationships with adults and when adults model these competencies. I go back to say this is a, that's one of the reasons we want the three tiers. We want a universal foundation where in many cases people are using approaches like positive behavior interventions and support to really create situations where students can feel more connected. And perhaps to integrate, as some schools are doing, positive behavioral supports and social emotional learning. Um, or schools that are doing universal social emotional learning and at the same time are integrating approaches to try to help students feel connected, for example, using class meetings or school-wide meetings to do that. In lots of ways, one can do these things that can build the foundation and promote the social emotional competencies of most young people. And then using the multi-tiered approach, one can do more intensive interventions for students who, have, who need more support if they're going to be able to develop this social and emotional competency. So for example, I, I was not identified when I was in school, but I probably struggle with ADHD. And for me to self-regulate requires more work. Doesn't mean that I couldn't learn to do it, but it does mean that a universal model alone would not be sufficient. I might have needed some behavioral training or something like that to help me. And so when we think about developing social and emotional competencies, it's important to think about not just doing it universally, but as we tier interventions, to keep on doing it. And when we use mentoring, mentoring is a way of developing social emotional competencies for young people who are at greater levels of need. There, there is an inc increasing body of evidence about the importance of developing social and emotional competencies and its relationship, as David said, about climate to academic achievement and other student outcomes. For example, in 2011, in Child Development, um, a research magazine a journal, there was a, a meta-analysis of 213 school-based programs. This is where you take individual experiments and you combine them to, in effect, statistically become one super experiment. And these were 213 school-based universal social emotional learning programs that involved over 270,000 students K through high, high school graduation. And what the meta-analysis determined is compared to controls, the, the students who received social emotional learning demonstrated in significantly improved social and emotional skills. For example, a 23 percentage point improvement in social competence. Um, and at the same time, enhanced academic performance. For example, an 11 percentile point gain in academic achievement even though these programs did not specifically target academic achievement. And so at the same time that one may be developing social emotional competence that can, can, can prepare young people to better handle crises, one can also be 
doing things that make it more likely that they will stay in school and succeed in school, so we can use our resources more efficiently. As David Eskwit said at the beginning, there are many ways of doing this work. Um, there are also many resources that you can use to learn about what we've talked about today. And in addition to the REM Center, let me just um, identify for you um, three places to go. Um, one is for more information about school climate and how to measure it, um, you can visit the National Center on Safe Supportive Learning Environments, which I'm, I serve as PIR on, at the web address that you have. Um, and among other things, you can find there a suite of webinars regarding how to develop and use and report out and identify interventions based on good school climate surveys. You can also find a list of 18 different school climate surveys that have been vetted. Um, for more information about the multi-tiered behavioral framework, and I mentioned positive behavior intervention support, you can visit the, the website of the Technical Assistance Center on Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. Um, and for further information about teaching social and emotional competencies, you can also go back to the same website for the National Center on Safe Supportive Learning Environments. And with this, I turn it back to Brian. Thanks, David. I think we're actually going to turn it back over to Sean. OK, um, we do have um, some time for some questions. Um, so just as a reminder for people who might want to submit questions, um, you can pose your question using the Q&A chat function on the lower right side of your computer screen. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sean. The first question we have is addressed to uh, David Esquith. Is there funding available for helping improve school climate? <clears throat> That's a great question. And um, the... <clears throat> In the President's 2014 budget, there is a proposal for what we're calling school climate transformation grants. And this is $50 million that will um, provide grants to local school districts as well as state educational agencies. The, uh, uh, the good news is that the, the Senate has uh, responded uh, positively to, to this proposal. and It's in the Senate uh, Appropriations Bill for 2014. Um, as everybody knows, we're, we're kind of waiting. Uh, everybody's kind of on the edge of their seats uh, in terms of what the House is going to do and on, on, on funding in 2014. Um, we're, we're, at this point, um, uh, being optimistic that um, there will be some funding for these uh, for these grants, and if there are, um, they will be the first time that the uh, 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 that this office, the Office of Safe and Healthy Students, will be making grants directly to uh, the local school districts um, to that, that address. Um, transforming school climate. We have had a very successful program of Safe Schools, Healthy Students, which was directed towards uh, uh, educational agencies, but our funding for that was withdrawn from, from Congress so that uh, uh, we don't have any further funding in that program. And um, we're looking forward to, uh, to Congress responding positively to the President's proposal and are being able to, to make grants to local school districts as well as state educational agencies on school climate in 2014. Thanks, David. The second question we have from participants is, do you recommend using non-anonymous school climate surveys? Um, this is David Osher. May I respond to that first? Sure. OK. Um, when you. I would very much recommend anonymous confidential surveys and not non-anonymous. Um, I think that um, the experience that many people in the field have is that if you use the types of surveys that David Esquith talked about that are valid and, and are, are generally reliable, you can also get candid information from people 
but only if they feel safe providing it. And so um, I think anonymity is important. At the same time, as David said, you can also disaggregate data. And so what, and I'll use my own experience here, but different surveys, people use different approaches. The way in which we tailor things is that we report out things by subgroups and at the same time, at a school level, suppress results when you have less than 10 people in a group. Um, and only then sum up at a district level. But in this way, while you don't know about an individual, you can see how fifth graders feel or how 11th graders feel. You can see how African American males feel or Caucasian females. And that can really help you target interventions. The same for your staff. But at the same time, if you were to really remove confidentiality, the data you collect are likely to be less reliable. And at the same time, what many people do is after they do surveys, they do do intentionally organized focus groups where you, where you don't have anonymity, but at the same time, people do feel comfortable feeling candid, but under some protections. Thanks, David. Yeah, this is David. I, I would just agree um, wholeheartedly with uh, David Osher's uh, uh, response that um, you can have a uh, an anonymous uh, school climate survey that gives you a lot of great information, and um, there are other methods, as he suggested, to uh, 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 focus groups and and uh, to, if where people would be identified. But I, I would uh, wholeheartedly support David's response to that. Thank you. The next question is related to the preceding question, and it's school climate can involve sensitive issues. How do you get buy-in or commitment for a school climate improvement process? David Esquith, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Yeah, well, yeah, why don't we both respond to this, David, and I'll, and, and I'll take that. You know, it, it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I, I think the the first step in getting buy-in to to addressing school climate is um, sharing information about what we know of the the impact of school climate on academic performance, on attendance, on um, dropout rate, on um, school safety, uh, uh, disciplinary referrals. Um, th there's there's a good bit of information out there that um, clearly demonstrates the, uh, uh, the, the very positive correlation between um, a positive school climate and the, uh, uh, the measures of academic uh, uh, performance and, uh, and um, attributes of a school that are um, uh, highly desired. So I would start with um, getting that information together, kind of sharing it, and then um, uh, uh, getting resources together that um, uh, also make it clear that improving school climate is, um, uh, is something that is being done around the country. Um, it is a, uh, 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 there are significant efforts and strategies that um, can be uh, utilized. And so I would begin with, um, we we can make we we can demonstrate that it has the uh, the desired effect, and we know that there are evidence based approaches to improving school climate that schools can can utilize. Dave, what what else? Yeah, and I would just add that what David just said, and with an elaboration, is available in a webinar that's on the the, the safe and supportive school environment website. Um, the only thing I would add is that over. As people start using the data and they find that, that it is actionable, that will help. It's important to really make sure you report it out in a way that people can make sense of it. And it doesn't just look like a, you know, a gobbledygook spreadsheet. And I think lastly what I'd add is over time it's important for leadership to develop an attitude towards data where it's important for people to know that it's okay to see negative data as long as you act on it. You know, oftentimes in school climate, people don't want to talk about it if, if it's not strong, but the way you make it stronger is by seeing where your problems are and addressing them. Back to you, Brian. Thanks. 
Dr. Osher. The final question for this afternoon is, surveys and interventions can be expensive. What are the costs associated with these types of programs? Good question. And um, yeah, they, they can be. Uh, and I would, uh, uh, I would caution um, the uh, uh, people who are consumers or, or are looking to, uh, uh, to utilize surveys and interventions to, um, to be smart consumers. As I said, the department is going to put out a, uh, uh, a, a school climate uh, uh, survey instrument, and it will be available for nothing. Um, and there will be technical assistance that will go with it, not only in terms of how to use the, uh, uh, the instrument, but also how to interpret the results and then move to, to interventions. In regard to um, uh, effective interventions, I, I, I strongly urge people to be uh, uh, smart consumers, to know that there is an evidence base behind programs. There are a lot of programs out there. Um, and the uh, uh, the first question that I would ask if I was um, uh, looking for a, uh, of a program to use in my school to, uh, to improve school climate is what's the evidence base that it is effective, that um, with the limited budgets that schools have, um, critically important that you um, spend your precious resources on um, programs and interventions that have been proven effective. And they, if they haven't been proven effective, I would be uh, um, reluctant to uh, uh, to invest in them. Dave, what's your experience? Yeah, no, I would say ditto, and the only and the only elaboration I'd say is what you want to know when you look at the evidence is does the evidence show that it will work with the type of children you're concerned with in your type of school? Which goes back to why you also want to tie this to school climate data and other data that show you where your needs are. Um, uh, um, be smart consumers. More is not better. Um, choosing the right things that you have the ability to implement well in your school is better. Thank you, Dr. Osher. It looks like we don't have any further questions, so now I'm going to turn it back over to the REMS TA Center. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for participating in our webinar and Q&A session. We hope that, that today's presentation provided you with a better understanding of how a positive school climate can enhance school safety. We invite you to visit the REMS TA Center website at http colon slash slash rems.ed.gov to view or share the archived webinar, access the collaborative guides, and or find resources pertaining to school climate, as well as additional resources, publications, and trainings to help you in your emergency operations planning efforts for schools. The resources on the REMS TA Center website support the development of comprehensive emergency operations plans for schools and IHE. Our searchable resource repository contains proven practices, tools, and other items developed by school emergency managers pertinent to the needs of local education agencies and IHEs as they engage in the process of emergency operations planning. Downloadable versions of the guides for developing high-quality school and IHE emergency operations plans are also available on the website. Archives of past webinars, including those providing an overview of the guides, as well as on special topics such as threat assessment, infectious diseases, and lockdown and evacuation procedure are also available on the website. The guides and resources are available now in the resources section of the site, and the archived version of this webinar will be available in the webinar section approximately five to seven business days from today. We also maintain a dedicated electronic email ad electronic mail address and a toll-free telephone number, 1-888-781-REMS or 7367, by which requests for technical assistance on topics pertaining to emergency operations planning for schools and IAGs may be submitted. <laughs>